I'm Dan Drost, as, uh, uh, as you might know. Um, I'm the vegetable specialist here at Utah State University. Um, I grew up on a small, uh, diverse vegetable and animal farm in Western Michigan, went to school at Michigan State and at Cornell University, and then came to Utah to be the vegetable specialist here. And, and I wanted to share some more uh, information that we have on growing Brussels sprouts. I think this is one of those crops that really has um, some potential and I'm uh, excited to hear what Stephanie says later on this morning about some other unique vegetables that we might uh, not think of growing, but we, what we probably should um, consider growing. So the, over, the presentation itself, uh, we're going to focus our attention um, on some of the varietal uh, findings that we were uh, interested in testing, uh, some work that we did on plant nutrition as well, particularly nitrogen nutrition, um, and then um, in attempts to create more uniform sprout development, um, talking about how we went through and achieved that over the course of this, the year. Uh, and then let's look at some marketing options uh, because once again, uh, Brussels sprouts are a little bit unique relative to what we do with other crops. And because they're kind of a long season crop, sometimes that creates some challenges for us that we need to address. And then I'll give you some conclusions. So we started out this kind of thinking about, oh, what should we do with varieties? We looked at a lot of different ones that were out there um, and then uh, initially uh, kind of honed in on an early maturing variety like Hestia. Um, we had a mid-season variety, Marta, and we had a kind of a late season type called Dagon. Um, and we evaluated those in our research work in 2020 and in 2021. And then in 2021, uh, we also kind of uh, started to look at a few other ones. We looked at Addis, uh, Dimitri, and Scorpius. Uh, which also are an early, a mid, and a late season. There's a lot of uh, uh, possible choices for you if you're going to grow Brussels sprouts. Um, some of you may be interested in, in heirloom types. Um, and there's a lot of those that are out there, uh, like Catskill, uh, Falstaff, uh, Red Noof, uh, Long Island. Um, they have benefits. We'll see uh, some of the 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 problems that you have with them. And we'll talk that, about that a little bit later, but we kind of focused in on our um, uh, F1 types or our hybrid types rather than open pollinated types. Now, all of them will grow well here. We've never had any problem. We've looked at a few of those other ones, but kind of focused our attention on the, the variety selection. So here, let's look at what these things look like. Um, We've got them laid out. Uh, the three that we were focused on, most of our research work on was Hestia, a short or early maturing type, Marta and Dagon, a late type. Um, you can see these, these are uh, different varieties that we uh, broke the growing point out or that they were topped. Um, and then you can kind of get a sense as to sprout development. One of the issues with early maturing types is you need to really be thinking about um, how tall these plants get, the number of sprouts that are on them themselves, um, what happens when they're getting close to maturity and the older sprouts near the bottom of the plant start to grow out or get too big or blow open, um, kind of just that's an issue. And so you can kind of look at those. Hestia is a little bit shorter than Martha and Dagon. It has a few fewer sprouts itself on it. Um, and uh, that may be, those may be considerations for you. And you can see in the later maturing type, the, the sprouts are somewhat more intermediate in size. Uh, um, they're, uh, you know, got some smalls up near the top and in, in the middle that still have some, some growth potential to them. So you have to kind of consider all of those things when you're, you know, focusing your attention on, on uh, a different varieties. Here's what Addis looks like in Dimitri and Scorpius. Um, Addis, once again, a little bit shorter. Uh, Dimitri slightly taller, and these you know, these height numbers that are there are basically from the cut surface up to the growing point um, that has been removed. Also note that those early maturing types, we get a few of those lower sprouts that get a little bit big and start to loosen up and get a little soft and may, maybe are less marketable. Dimitri tended to have pretty good uniformity all the way up the stalk. 
Um, Scorpius being a late maturing type uh, also had some sizing issues that still needed to be addressed. And, and as the season progressed, they did a, a better job of that. And so um, why you may want to have differences in maturity are really associated with where you're particularly growing this. We were kind of focused here on in Logan where we have, um, you know, from when we would plant to when we would think we were harvesting would be, you know, kind of in that 120 day range. So we figured that any of these would work, but the early maturing types might fit into the niche so that you have material that's maturing in late September or early October, rather than something like Scorpius um, or Dagon, which are gonna mature maybe into mid to late um, October, which might be a little bit late for some locations within Utah. Um, some of the keys to making this system work, um, we got to be thinking about uh, seed germination um, and propagation. Uh, we tended to put ours in 128 trays. Um, we used a good soil mix, uh, making, making sure that is sterile. You can do all of these things either conventionally or organically. Um, there really isn't a, a, a big difference, I don't think, between what I'm going to say today for any of those types of things. We put them on the heating pad. Um, and then once those um, first seedlings just started to crack the surface, we pulled them off the heat. We don't wanna leave them on the heat until they all emerge because then what happens is your uh, hypocotyl region or that point below the seed leaves, you know, it stretches out and you get a floppy plant. We want a really compact and uh, well-statured plant. Generally our seed germination, it should be in around that 70 to 75, 80 range, um, and that heat can help you with that as well. When you're seeding these things to get them up quick, don't plant them too deep either. They're pretty small seeds. They need to be up near the soil surface. And then ultimately, when you're growing them, you want to have a nice root ball that forms. You can see that in the, in the upper right-hand picture, we have a, a root ball that's about 50% soil, 50% roots are visible on the outside of that. That means that plant is, is ready to be transplanted. It's not root bound or pot bound. Um, we just want it to be able to hold together so I can extract it and then put it and plant it out in the field. And then I want a plant that doesn't have a lot of leaves on it either, three to four leaves. My student workers here who are planting the trial, they basically said that with one of these push planters and it has a a drop tube on it up at the top there. Um, they could just take those plants and then and push them, drop them right in that, and they slid right down to the bottom and were planted. And then the person behind is kind of throwing a little bit of soil up around them just to make sure that the root ball was covered um, and also to keep the, the plant off of the plastic because the plastic can get pretty warm when we're transplanting these because we're planting them not as early as most people think. We're planting a little bit later into the springtime. And we're using white plastic as well because that reflects a little bit of that heat and it's a little bit cooler. So we got black on white and one side is black, one side is white and that helps it work together. And they said with those push planters like that, they could, they could plant a, row, you know, a whole row like that within you know, maybe 10 or uh, 10 to 15 minutes. It didn't take very long to do that at all. And it was quite a, a, a an enjoyable process rather than bending over. Growth requirements for the crop. Again, now as we're thinking about the crop growing, you gotta be thinking about where you live. Um, and so we wanna have, you know, Brussels sprouts grow best when temperatures are above 40. When temperatures get up to around 90 or something like that, they're under a little bit of stress and they maybe don't like that. And so we kind of want to look at a day optimum day temperature range of somewhere in that 50 to 80. And they do most be beneficial when the temperatures um, are right around that 75 degrees. The, uh, and so that kind of looking for that optimum temperature range, kind of evaluate where you live and, and look at that. And, and if you have uh, questions about wanting to try and do some of this in some of our um, areas of, of Utah, uh, just you know, shoot me an email and we'll kind of help you figure out how to find the data that you need so that you can uh, do the assessment. The upper panel there is just how fast they germinate. So if our temperatures are warmer, they germinate faster. And that's why we were propagating these things at the 70 to 80 range. But that's also the, the range of temperatures where growth is 
um, kind of best. You know, they grow fast when it's when it's uh, warmer and they grow slow when it's cooler. The other thing is we looked at, you know, kind of our climate conditions here in Logan. And one thing I like to do is kind of look at what my monthly average temperatures are. And you can see that in May we're, you know, starting to warm up nicely, um, gets a little hotter in June, July it's and August are our warmest months up here in Logan. And then it starts to cool off in September. And it's really that June, July, August, September time period that's critical because that's in that where that crop is growing and, and, and maturing. And, and Brussels sprouts are pretty cold hardy. So, you know, we can even, you know, got, we've got a lot of growth in October, um, even into November, uh, we saw this. So let's look at the crop development here quickly. Um, what we see in crop development is, uh, you know, the, their finished planting, our planting dates were somewhere around that uh, May uh, 25 to 20 uh, to the end of the May, we tried to target in at that time window. And then in, a, in about a, a month's time or a little bit over a month's time, you can start to see that the plants are, you know, kind of filling in, but they're not stretching. So this is, you know, kind of laying the foundation, they're getting their root system in place, and then they're working from there. And then as we get into late July, those plants, that's when they're really extending up. And remember, our July temperatures are somewhere in that, uh, you know, about mid 80s range here, average monthly daily temperatures for the highs and lows. And, and then at August, they're really starting to, to pop nicely. And in August, we generally start seeing the sizing of those first uh, Brussels sprouts that are down near the base of the plant. And we're gonna use that as kind of targeting to help us figure out um, uh, when we need to do a topping event. Another issue that we kind of have to address is, um, you know, what are the nutritional needs? And so if you need to grow sprouts, you, you really should have a soil test. I would say that for any of the crops that we grow, if you don't get one every year, that's okay, but get one, you know, about every couple of years and kind of use it as a measure of, of what you've got going on in your soil. And then if you also can afford it, try to get a nitrate value and try to get an organic matter um, value for it. And we did it for these. And the reason we would do that is because we can credit the nitrates that are in the soil and the organic matter as a way to reduce the amount of N that we're going to apply. And if you've been to any of the, of the nutrient sources to try and purchase fertilizer this year, nitrogen costs are up substantially. Um, and there's shortages, um, there it's, it's getting more expensive. And so you really wanna kind of pay attention to ways to reduce the amount that you have to apply. And so if we use that example and our target goal is let's say 150 units of nitrogen we think we need for this particular crop, then the credits that I can get from knowing nitrates and knowing organic matter are maybe substantial. In the case of um, the nitrate, it's probably more important than it is the organic matter because organic matter credit is relatively small and our soils tend to be fairly low in organic matter anyway. Uh, but with that nitrate value, we measured ours and we had a, a, a nitrate level of eight. And so that means I credited almost 30 pounds of nitrogen which is pretty significant when we come out so that we basically would say that what we would need for the crop would be about 118 pounds. If we look at kind of these um, uptake values, uh, the blue and the orange line are nitrogen and, and potassium. You can see that, um, that they're pretty steadily increased needs from, from early July all the way through to about early September when they start to flatten out. So that's the time when we got to target our nutrients. And if you don't know what you have in your soil or you haven't had a soil test in a while, um, basically use these as kind of go-to numbers. Um, about 150 units of N, um, put about 125 units of uh, potash on there and uh, or of potassium on there and then a 200 units of potash. Um, and, and what that will do is it'll kind of kind of meet those target needs that you see in that graphic. You can see that phosphorus, we don't need quite as much of, the plant doesn't take up a lot, but um, we would kind of use those particular numbers to get us a, a sense of it. And then how do you go about figuring out how to apply it? Well, what we wanna do is we wanna target that in at um, specific values. And so we used a low, medium and high um, 
nitrogen application. We put a base application of 50 units of nitrogen down about a week or 10 days before we were gonna plant, put our beds in place, put the plastic down, uh, had the drip underneath there and then went from there. And then every week or so we were on a sliding scale adding either five, 10 or 15 units to these various plots for those three varieties that we were growing with the idea that our general recommendation says, oh, let's target in at about 150 units as being what's needed. If you go into the literature and look at other states that grow Brussels sprouts and what their extension services recommend, the range is huge, 125 to 250. It depends on kind of what you're growing. Um, and so we said, well, let's bracket those. And so at the end of the year, when we were done, we were on a low number, about 110, 170, 230, to try and get into that end range from what other sources said to see if we were seeing a response to nitrogen for the various uh, plants that we were growing. And then we looked at that. And essentially what we know with nitrogen is that if we add more, there's enough information there that says we're gonna increase our marketable yield. That would be the number of sprouts. We generally have fewer small sprouts, which actually maybe aren't marketable, but we have more cull sprouts because some of them are gonna blow up too big and we may, may not be able to sell them or they're a little soft and we don't want that either. So if we look at that kind of requirement over time, think about our graph of timing events and stuff here. We're gonna reach maximum height in mid to late August. Um, the early sprouts are forming. We're gonna come in and top them sometime in late August, early September. And then we're gonna size those sprouts after that. Basically, we're trying to catch all of that and into that rapid growth period because I want these plants to be really tall that have a lot of leaves on them because in the, in the axle of each one of those leaves, we're gonna have a sprout. And what did we find? We found that there really wasn't any difference in terms of how those plants grew based on the nitrogen. So if we were metering it out slowly to the plant, we're not putting big amounts on, we injected it through the irrigation that come September when we're getting those little sprouts that are starting to size, they're looking really good um, and had no effect. So we could probably use about 125 to 150 is our gonna be our recommendation for growing this particular crop, which is not substantial. We looked at a little bit at irrigation. We know that soils and crop uses vary depending on the growth of that. We tried to do some monitoring and budgeting. Um, brassica crops on the whole are drought tolerant, uh, but if you stress them too much, growth slows down. They become more non-uniform. We also get bitter off flavors and people complain all the time, Brussels sprouts taste bad. Um, that's because they're just be probably stressed. And, and so you get those off flavors, metallic flavors. And sometimes you get some damage internal to the, the developing sprout, which we call tip burn. And, and we basically use the monitoring device. We use aerometers, with have, which have tubes and, um, and they measure the, the soil moisture content and centibars. Um, and we just track those over the course of the season. And when we kind of looked at those events, basically you can see that um, when you have the scale on the, your axis here um, is dates on the top and on the side axis is uh, the soil moisture uh, water content. And we're trying to target in and around that 35 range. That's uh, what our soil says is, you know, keeping it moist, but not wet. And, and the blue line is up near the surface. That's eight inch uh, depth for the, the sensor. And you can see that bounces around a lot. The 12 inch depth is in orange, that bounces around a lot. And every time we ran irrigation, it lifted that up and then the plant extracted it. But it was really those that orange, yellowish one and gray line that we were particularly interested in because those are the deeper depths. And, and we wanted them to be relatively stable and not to change too much. Uh, when it was really hot early in July, it was 95 day temperatures you could see that those deeper depths where the plant was extracting water out of those and we needed to make sure that we got enough water even deeper in the profile so that by the middle of July, it was still hot. We were adding more water, get big spikes. We're getting it almost super wet and help bring those numbers up and then starting to drag them down again. And so this kind of can help you measure that. And so 
once again, if there's issues with your soil, we just need to know what your soil types are and then we can start to calculate those things for you as well. We finally went in and did some topping on things and topping is important because it creates uniformity. Basically, when we see a sprout about a half inch diameter, we won't go in and we uh, take the, the growing point out of it. And that's important for us to help create uniformity. What we see with Brussels sprouts is um, if you leave the top in, the bottom sprouts get bigger first and the top sprouts grow later. If you want to continually harvest off the same plant, that's a really good way to do it. And you can do that for open pollinated types or the hybrid types, which are more uniform. Or if you top them, what that does is that means every sprout from the bottom to the top tend to develop at the same rate because the growing point has been removed and that works out really, really good for us. So that going back to this, it's a nice way to create uniformity at harvest. And you can see that these are a, a non-top plant, the Addis, we just had some pictures there. You can see the sprouts get progressively smaller as one um, goes from the bottom here all the way up to the top. And up at the top, we have really tiny sprouts. And so I could harvest these and then not harvest those. When I topped it, now I got more uniformity all the way up the stalk when I harvested those. And these were a, a good way for you to get that and, and use it in the marketing. Now, what was our productivity like? What we saw is that we get really good productivity. We're getting about a pound and a half to almost a pound and three quarters um, on plants. When we didn't top them, we had lower yields because we have more sprouts up at the top. These small sprouts um, are up at the top are not yet big enough to market. And so if I don't top them, I have that if I'm just doing a, a once over harvest. And we can see that for every type. We also saw that Marta probably is one of our better varieties at, at mid-season varieties. And I apologize, this, this Marta, yeah, it's a 110 day one. We can see that it produces a lot of nice yield, um, has a few smalls, but not too many, doesn't have a lot of culls. Culls are oversized at the bottom here, that, that, and they're also ones that are maybe have some other kind of insect or disease or damage to them that get uh, thrown out. It's still a little bit higher than we want, um, but you know, lots of that has to do with these ones that don't meet our, our yield requirement. And the USDA standard says that anything between one and two and a half inches can be marketed. Anything less than that or above that can't be. And we were getting uh, differences between the years and the usable percentage. The reason that 2020 wasn't quite so good compared to 2021 is that we had a lot more insect pressure in 2020 that kept us at um, working on trying to deal with worms um, and diamondback moth larvae that were feeding on the plant. What are some of our marketing opportunities as we get here toward the end of our session? Um, early harvest can be, work good, but Brussels sprouts are a late crop. So sometimes if we're dealing with farmers markets, that might not work, but it could work. It's still in a pumpkin season and those kind of things It could work. I was in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania a couple of weeks ago for some conference meetings, um, went down to the local farmers market on, they have one on a Sunday and I went in and looked at it. And here's a picture of the sprouts that were on their market. And they were basically saying the grower was getting $6 a stock for those. Um, and, and he said the, the business was good. He said that he liked it. And he said he probably could charge a little bit more, but he said he moved a lot of stocks. You could bag them. There's different ways that we see them sold, bags of some sort. Um, generally those might sell for somewhere between two to $4 a pound, depending. Um, a stock itself has maybe 60, 50 to 60 uh, sprouts on it. Um, and that is an option for us. One of the things that the marketer did here in Harrisburg, he had a little recipe thing and he had a few recipes that were on cards and people could pick them up when they grabbed their thing. If you're going to want to try and store some, um, you could try and do that as well. They do have a reasonably good shelf life, but be careful where you store them because they are ethylene sensitive. So if you have apple or, or any of the ethylene generating fruits around, um, that can cause discoloration for them as well. And then the question is, could you leave them in, in the field over winter? And, and, and that's something that uh, we kind of explore a little bit. This is the remnants of what we had from 2021 in our 
field still out there. Some of those varieties, you can see shed leaves like this variety down here. Uh, this plant has shed most of its leaves and those uh, that cold temperature is damaging those sprouts that are exposed. But other varieties like this, this one back here, that's a different variety and I'd have to go and look at my list. It has nice wrapper leaves that basically shield the whole stalk. Um, and when I've gone out in early February, I cut some of these. I, I took frozen plants, stuck them in my cold garage and in about three days they were thawed out. They actually aren't too bad. So it's a, a possibility of doing it that way. So in conclusions then, select your varieties carefully, look at establishment, make sure you're careful with your nutrition, uh, watch your water because it's really important, particularly in a warm year. Top that crop, you'll get better uniformity. And uh, with that, um, I'll address any questions that may come up, have come up during the course of the, the presentation. And I didn't see um, any questions in the chat. Um, we'll, um, or in the Q and A. Okay. So um, there was one question in Q and A, but I don't think it's um, one that you want to address here. Okay, I'll I'll get that one later. Um, but it, if if you need some resources that we have, um, the production horticulture um, uh, website uh, that's part of Extension. You can go to Extension. .usu.edu and then look for production horticulture. And in the production horticulture section, um, there's a lot of diff different uh, front panel tabs that deal with fruits, small fruits, vegetables, um, and uh, flowers. Um, and in some of the management tracks, we have publications on how to grow vegetable transplants. You can see that one here. So you can do it for that. If you wanna know more about how to go set up drip irrigation and how to make that work. If you wanna work on actually specific irrigation recommendations for certain vegetables, we have those and we're always adding some more in there. If you need some information on fertilization and that type of stuff, um, there's a lot of chance for you to go into that fertilizer one and it tells you about how to put fertilizer out on small areas and calculate that. If you are growing organically, um, you're going to need to think about with Brussels sprouts and some of the cabbage plants, how do I control my worms um, and aphids that might get in there. And then the second thing you're gonna to need to kind of focus your attention on is, um, you know, how, how are you gonna, you know, deal with the fertilizer components because injecting, sometimes injecting high nitrogen fertilizers into um, organic systems is somewhat problematic. And so that may, preclude how you do some things. But if you've got some questions on that after the fact, shoot me an email and we'll um, you know, kind of go through and, and address those. So the, uh, we're at the, um, I think we've got, uh, what do we got time-wise here? We got about one minute um, and so, so. A few questions came in on the Q&A. Did you see those, um, Dan, that just in the last like minute? Okay. Um, the first one was what pests should we, part and Anticipate and what are the best ways to prevent them? Okay, so the pests are in, in go to our vegetable production guide and the pest management component. This publication gets um, updated on a yearly basis and we go through and do it. The, the, the main pests that we ran into were aphid, which is um, can be a real issue in brassica crops. Um, and then we had problems with uh, the white butterfly uh, and also with diamondback moths. And those larvae are pretty aggressive. You can see one here in the middle, you know, they basically feed on the, in the lower part of the plant. And, and then in the pest management guidelines, we have um, pesticides listed for commercial um, non-organic type of materials to use. And then there's a, a section for uh, registered organic materials as well. Um, and all of those have been tested and work reasonably well, provided you follow the recommendations on the labels of those products. And so I think the two big issues were those uh, were aphids and, and worms. And, and we were able to control them a little bit better because we had less pest pressure in 21 than we did in 20. Okay. And then... Out of curiosity, do you know what 
what or no say what would um the stocks in the field be marketable in february how could, late could these be sold march yeah well that's a good question i i know i've harvested brussels sprouts out of the field we left them there all winter and i'm going out you know that late this week and i'm going to cut some more stocks down and 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 slowly thaw them out that's the main thing slowly so if you got a, a cold area that you can put them in that can so they don't thaw out super fast then they don't go so mushy they're a little bit soft at this time of the year because they've been frozen solid and we've been so cold so i think maybe down in the salt lake area where it's not nearly as cold um, you might be able to get by with that 